Today we're going to get the new 3 horsepower spindle wired up and take it for a test run. And hopefully we can avoid letting the smoke out. Or more precisely, letting any more of the smoke out. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. In my notorious Christmas video, I showed the new 3 horsepower automatic tool changer spindle that I picked up to install on my CNC mill. This video is the first part in a series dedicated to getting that connected, mounted on the mill, and integrated into the CNC controls. The goal for today is to get the Hitachi VFD and all of the supporting electronics safely installed into a cabinet wire it all together and take the spindle motor for a test run. Now we've got a three horsepower motor, a 7.2 kilowatt power supply, and a VFD with more parameters than you can shake a stick at. So if there's ever gonna be an electro boom moment on this channel, it's gonna be today. Let's go over to the bench and get started. This is a spindle that I showed in the Christmas video. This is an FM30F. This came from CNC Depot, and it's actually a uh, pre-release motor. This is something that they're not actually marketing yet. I found out about it talking to Alex there about one of their other spindles, and he suggested that this may be a better fit for my application. Just to be clear, I'm not sponsored. I paid for this spindle directly, so um, I don't have a, any kind of a sponsorship deal there. But the reason that this is probably gonna be a better fit for my application is because this is a four pole spindle motor. Most of the CNC spindles or router spindles that you would buy from Chinese sources are two pole motors. And what that means is that when you feed them in the maximum 400 Hertz uh, power that you get from most VFDs, they'll spin at 24,000 RPMs. This one being a four pole motor will spin at half that. It'll spin at only 12,000 RPM with 400 Hertz power. And so you don't have as high of a top speed, but the advantage is it should have more torque at lower speeds. So in theory, I should be able to not only use this up around you know, 12,000 RPM with small tools in aluminum, I should be able to run this at lower RPMs with probably still small tools in steel. So I should be able to still do CNC milling in steel with this. Time will tell, we'll see. As, I, as you are aware, you know, I don't have this on the machine yet. I can't really make any kind of a recommendation about whether this is a great spindle or not because I haven't used it. Specs look good, I'm hopeful. We're gonna go ahead and get this on the machine here ultimately and we'll all find out together. Now on the back of this spindle are all of the connectors. We have an electrical connector and this has the three phases of the motor plus a safety ground plus two wires for a uh, thermal cutout so that if the motor overheats we have a feedback signal to the VFD so we can trip the VFD and shut it down and not burn up the motor. We also have two uh, quarter inch outside diameter push to connect fittings for air. This one here on the outside edge is for purge air for the case and the one closer to the center is to activate the draw bar. So it's a pneumatic draw bar to release the tool, let go of the pull stud and allow the tool to be uh, extracted and to put a new tool in and grip it. Now the purge air on the case has to do with the way the bearing seals work. On the business end of the spindle, we've got the 30 taper opening here, and we have the, uh, the spindle rotates here, and there's a seal around that bearing to prevent stuff from going in. But since this is a really high speed operating spindle, a rubber seal isn't very effective at high speeds, plus you get friction and heat. So I believe what this actually has is a labyrinth seal which is a couple of pieces of metal with rings that fit together and interlock so that you have a long passage for things to get in or out. But the way this keeps things out and keeps them from getting into the spindle is with compressed air. So there's a supply of compressed air going into the case. It's about two cubic feet per minute at 90 PSI. And that is constantly flowing through the case and constantly flowing out through the labyrinth seal at the nose. And so that constant flow of air coming out 
prevents coolant and chips or grinding dust or you know whatever you're doing with the spindle prevents debris and coolant from getting in and destroying the spindle nose bearings. The bearings in this spindle are steel, hence the top speed of 12,000 RPM. In theory, if you had a high speed inverter that could go above 400 Hertz, you could go faster. They're good to 18,000. They do have ceramic bearings available for these, so you can run them to 24,000, especially on the two pole version of this spindle. But for the four pole, I'm only gonna run it to 12,000, so the steel bearings are gonna be sufficient. This spindle came with a cable set. Uh, you can see the connector here. This mates with the top of the spindle. There's a little O-ring seal, and this, has, of course, has the same pin pattern, and it came with this already made up cable set. This is actually pretty nice, already pre-terminated. We'll hook all of this stuff up in a minute, but uh, this is something that would be a pain to do because the cable wiring is you know, pretty heavy in here. The individual conductors are fairly large, and so doing a nice, neat job of termination into a nice connector like this is a tedious and complicated task. So I'm glad that came with it. Now before I run this at all, I want to connect the purge air. I do not want to run the spindle without having some kind of air source hooked up because uh, I don't want to risk getting any debris back into the spindle bearings. Now, I don't want to just hook this up to shop air because the shop air comes right off the compressor. It isn't filtered. It could have debris in it. It could have water in it. Uh, I want to run the air to this through a filter and a dryer, or at least a water separator. So when I picked up all of the uh, additional parts to hook this up, I got an air filter. Now this is a two-stage filter. There's a coarse filter followed by a fine filter plus a pressure regulator to set the pressure that actually goes into the spindle. So in this case, the fine filter is a 0.3 micron filter, so it's very fine and should remove any kind of contaminants that could be a problem for the spindle bearings. Now this has uh, eighth inch non-parallel threads, and I've got the right push to connect fittings here, so let's just go ahead and hook this up so we can have a clean air supply for the spindle for testing. Oh, those are not eighth inch NPT. Those are quarter inch NPT. I got some of those too. Okay, we'll connect the supply air to this fitting on this side. And the output on this side. And then we'll connect that into the spindle. Let me go connect to the compressor and let's get some air flowing here. I'll go ahead and dial this up to 90 PSI or something like it. Okay, I'm not sure if you can hear that, but we definitely have air coming out through the spindle now. So I think we are about ready. I'll go ahead and shut the air off for now to get out the electronics and uh, get those hooked up. Now, when I've set up previous VFDs, like the one on the lathe and other electrical boxes, like the one for the electronic lead screw, I used a CHKO series Hammond box that um, didn't have a backing panel which means I just put all the components in the box and built the electronics in there screwed directly to the back. This time I'm using a different kind of a box that actually does have a sub panel. So there's a sheet metal panel that comes with the box or you buy it separately that is separate. You can mount all the components on it so when the screws come through the back, they don't go through the back of the box, they just go through the back of the panel, and then the panel mounts on standoffs inside the enclosure. So this is convenient for a number of reasons. One, the screws don't stick out the back of the box, so you don't have to have it out on furring strips, you can actually mount it flush to a surface. But also it allows you to work on the electronics out in the open so they're not buried down inside a box. 
So I've gone ahead and connected up all of the components that we need for this VFD installation onto this panel. And as you can see, the 12 by 14 inch box that I got is kind of the bare minimum size that would actually fit all of this. So let's take a look at what we have here. So first of all, down here in the corner, we have fuse blocks. I've got two 30 amp fuses and a two amp fuse. Now the two 30 amp fuses are for the main power that's coming in for the VFD. This is 220 volts, or in my shop, it's 240 volts at 30 amps. So what is that? 7.2 kilowatts is a significant power supply. Even though it's only a 2.2 kilowatt inverter, three horsepower, it can, if the voltage level drops or if you get into overload conditions, it can actually draw more power than that. So it requires 30 amp service to the input side of the VFD. So I've got a 220 or 240 volt uh, 30 amp service here in the shop to run this on. And so I'm running the two hot wires through 30 amp fuses, and then those go up to a contactor. And this contactor is to turn that power on and off. We feed out the other side of the contactor to this noise filter. And this is a 30 amp uh, RFI noise filter designed specifically for this application. It's a two stage uh, noise filter with uh, inductors and capacitors in it to filter radio frequency noise and prevent that from getting out of the inverter and back into the power supply. So then after we come through that, that power then feeds down and goes to the input phases on the inverter. So that's the main power circuit for the inverter. Next, we have a 24 volt power supply. And this 24, 24 volt power supply is gonna be used for a few things. It's gonna run a cooling fan in the box. It's gonna be used to run the solenoid for the uh, air for the power draw bar on the spindle. And it's also used to activate the contactor to switch in the 220 volt uh, power. Now, normally in a situation like this, you would set up either a big e-stop button or some other control buttons to turn the contactor power on and off. I'm taking a little bit different approach. I already have 120 volt power in my CNC mill enclosure in the wiring box for the CNC controls. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this power supply off of that separate 120 volt supply. That's what this other two amp fuse is for. We'll feed that power in here to this 24 volt power supply. So when that supply is switched on, it'll supply power to this power supply, which will switch on the contactor and turn on the VFD. When I turn off the power in the CNC control box, this will switch off, the contactor will open, and the VFD will shut down. So the VFD power is just being remotely controlled by the CNC power in you know, the power in the CNC control panel. So I've got the, the 48 volts here, and then that's wired down to some screw terminals down here just for power distribution to hook up the fan and the other uh, components that are gonna be in here. Let's uh, get this installed into the box and get it wired up. This is the box that I'm using. This is uh, a little nicer than the CHKO series enclosures that I typically use. It's got a nice textured powder coat. The reason I got the more expensive box is because it, I needed something that was deeper to fit the Hitachi VFD that I'm using. Uh, this is actually eight inches deep as opposed to the CHKO boxes I usually use, which are um, only six inches deep and are a quarter of the price. This is about $100 for a box this size, and uh, but I, as I said, I've been really impressed with it. Really nice powder coat finish. This is actually made in the USA, actually made by the union. There's the Smart Union logo in here. Now I've gone ahead and made the modifications that I needed to the box. You can see I've cut a hole here and put in a fan grill. That's the exit air. The VFD air will come out of the VFD. It'll come out here. It's gonna come in the bottom. I've got another fan grill on the outside here and the fan mounted on the inside. This is a 90 millimeter um, uh, 24 volt fan. Got the wires pre-terminated with ferrules on them all ready to go. Now I've got power feeding in. This is the 220 volt power that feeds in down in this corner. 
and building a chord set for 220 is complicated, so I cheated. I actually just bought off of Amazon a 30 amp twist lock 220 volt uh, power extension cord um, because I was going to have to go source the SOOW uh, rubber wire and I was going to have to source the connectors and by the time I got you know all that figured out um, and looked at the price it was cheaper just to buy the cord set so I just bought one cut it off to length and mounted it here in the enclosure. So this will go in the wall after everything's connected here. Um, and uh, then, and that'll provide the 220 volt power input. For the 110 volt power that's coming over from the CNC control panel to power this up and run the contactor, I've just got an ordinary line cord. This was just an IC computer line cord. I just cut it off ran it through a, uh, a grommet or ran it through a, a cable gland. And I've got that terminated and ready to go. And then for control wiring, I've actually already mounted the connectors in the side of the box here. And I've got a couple. Um, the VFD actually uses an RJ45 connector for the remote control. And so I've just got a pass through bulkhead connector for RJ45 to pass that through the case. And then I've got two circular polarized connectors that I will use for data. One of these is gonna go out to the foot pedal and, and the power signal wires to run the, um, the valve for the uh, automatic tool changer. And then the other one is gonna connect over for control to the CNC panel. And so that'll provide control of the VFD remotely through Mach 3 or Mach 4 if I ever upgrade, and also provide e-stop signals and trip signals back and forth so that the CNC machine can trip if the VFD trips, or if I hit the e-stop on the CNC machine, it can stop the spindle as well. And I haven't populated any of the pins in here because they're crimp pins, and I don't want to actually crimp and use up uh, those pins until I'm actually ready and know how long the cables are going to be. So for today, anything we hook up, we'll just hook up inside the case. So let me grab the panel and let's get it mounted. Now, I have to say, I have purchased a lot of tools recently, and I've got a lot of tools here in the shop, but this was an unexpected pleasure. This is a little Craftsman screwdriver that I picked up at my local Ace Hardware store. And, you know, I've, you know, I believe that Craftsman was a good name back in the day, and they made some good tools, and then there kind of came a time when, yeah, maybe they weren't as good as they used to be, but you could still walk into a Sears and get them replaced if anything happened. And then there's today, where it's basically a zombie brand, and it's been licensed out to everybody, and so every home center and hardware store carries Craftsman stuff, and my assumption is, you know, it's pretty much all junk. But I needed a long screwdriver to actually reach down and get to the screws in the bottom of this box without having to bang my knuckles around in here. So I was in an Ace Hardware and found this, and it's a Craftsman screwdriver. It's like an 8 or 10 inch long shaft, Phillips. And I was really surprised. It's actually made in the USA. And I'm also really surprised with the tip on this thing. It grips the screws really well. And yeah, maybe it won't last, I don't know, but it just made me happy to find a little made in the USA tool in my local hardware store that actually works. And uh, yeah, I know it's just a screwdriver, but it made me happy. Now the fourth screw that goes down in this corner actually has a little star washer that goes on it so that this screw will make electrical contact with the panel because as you can see down here, there's a ground connection. All the grounds are star wired back to it and it's connected to the sub panel and so this little star washer cuts through the powder coat so that we'll get electrical contact to the box so the box will also be grounded.
And now we just hook everything up. And the last thing I want to add here is the jumper wire for the VFD external control panel. Plug that in there. And then take that down to the bulkhead connector. Uh, last is the cable for the uh, spindle motor itself. And I've just got this through a uh, cable gland. So now we need to connect the three phase wires, the UV and W lines, to the VFD. Uh, I'm going to run these through some ferrites to try to filter some of the radio frequency noise. This does a few things. This takes out high frequency common mode energy that could actually damage the motor bearings and it helps to prevent radiated energy uh, from this cable from causing interference to other systems here in the shop. Now, um, this is not ideal, these small ferrites. There are much larger ferrites that are designed for that. I've actually got one ordered. When it comes in, maybe we'll talk about those a little bit more. So let me go ahead and hook these up. Okay, those are the phases. The last are the thermal switch. So this is the thermal cutout. Um, if the motor overheats, this is a normally closed circuit, so energy is, or electricity is normally conducting between the two. And if the motor overheats, this will open up and we wanna connect that to the VFD so it will know that's happened and can cut the power. So I'm gonna connect one side of this to the L, which is the negative terminal. And the other side I'm gonna to set to input number three and then we'll program the VFD to know that input number three is uh, E-stop. So it'll automatically cut the motor power if that opens up. Okay, that is a nice neat installation. I've already got the fuses in here, a pair of 30 amp fuses. And in this case is a 10 amp fuse because it's all I had, two amp fuses are coming in the mail. Um, uh, so I've got a 10 amp in here, but it will be a two amp when uh, things are ready to go. Uh, this actually has a fuse internally in the power supply, so I'm not too concerned about that. Okay, let me hook up some power and let's just power it on and make sure that it actually powers up before we go any further. Okay, I have the 220 volt power connected to the wall, but of course nothing has happened because the 110 is not connected. And as soon as I plug this in, the contactor should close and it should all power up. And there it goes. You're hearing the fan in the VFD, but the fan in the case is also turning and the display is on. So I think we are good. Let me close this up and uh, let's get a program, see if we can make this thing turn. Okay, programming the VFD. Um, this is a complex VFD that has a lot of features. And so I went ahead and just printed out the manual. And the manual for this thing is 400 pages. And I went through all of it. I tried to take some shortcuts and ran into some problems and decided that if I was gonna figure this out, I just need to read through the entire manual. And as you can see here, I've got all these little red tabs in the side here. These are all parameters that were of interest to me that I think I may want to use at some point, uh, not all of them today, but um, this is kind of what's involved in getting some of this sorted out. So I've gone through this process and I'm gonna give you the short version of what we need to do to get this VFD running on this spindle. So hopefully if you come along and do something similar, you won't have to spend all of this time. Though honestly, if you're gonna do something like this, I do highly recommend going through the manual and actually understanding everything that's going on because there are ways you can get into trouble. Most of the time though, you don't need to change most of the settings. There are just a few things that are needed and the manual does kind of walk through that. So let's power this back up. I have the external control connected so we can do all the programming from here. So that powers on and we've got our display here. 
So let's take a look at the settings. So this manual's got all the detailed information about all the settings, and I've gone through and figured all this stuff out, but then it has another section here in the back, which is just the uh, table in the order of how the settings uh, are on the control panel menu so that you can just um, set it up and actually just go through and you have a record so if you have to come back and program it later. So there's a few things that are necessary first and there is one huge gotcha and that is that this VFD comes configured for simple operation mode and they call it the software lock mode selection and by default it has a bunch of parameters that are not actually available in the menus and so you have to go in here and change B031 to 10 in order to allow access to all of the menus so we can say a function and go through till we get to the B's whoops I just hit it there's B and we need to go to 31 31, set that, and it is set to 1. Is that right? B031 is currently set to 1, and I want to set that to 10. So hit that, set it to 10, set. Okay, so now B031 is now set to 10. So now we actually have access to change all of the other settings in the VFD. So let's start with um, a few simple things. We want the frequency source that changes the speed of the motor. We want that to actually come from this pot on the external control, and that's controlled by A001. So we go back around to A, A001, and we want to set that to zero. Okay, zero, that's the pot on the external controller. That's this. Our run command source, like where do we want it to run? I want it to run from this run key right here. We're not going to set up any external controls. So that's A002, and that needs to be set to 02, which is what's already set. Okay, now we have to set the frequencies for the motor. Now, the VFD normally assumes that you have a 60 hertz motor. This spindle is not a 60 hertz motor. This is a 400 hertz motor and that turns out to be critically important. I played around with this a little bit previously, and I tried to power this up with it set to 60 hertz, not knowing any better, and the VFD immediately started pumping too much current through the motor. It immediately overheated, and I actually got a little bit of smoke out of it. A little bit of smoke started coming out through that labyrinth seal. I panicked, shut it down, contacted Alex at uh, CNC Depot and he said that that is not the first time that's happened. He's actually done it himself. The key is you have to set this up as a 400 hertz motor in the VFD, otherwise it will try to send full vo voltage to the motor at slow speed and it will overheat. Um, I have no idea what that means long term. Certainly some of the insulation in the motor was damaged by that. It still seems to be okay. And um, if anything happens, you know, they said they'd take care of it. So we'll, uh, we'll see how this goes. But I expect that it's going to be fine. But we do need to set the base frequency of the motor in order to avoid that happening in the future. That's A003. But in order to be able to set that up to 400, you have to set the maximum frequency on the inverter up that high first. So that's A004. So A004, I've already got that set to 400 and then back down to A003, set that, that's set to 400. That's the base frequency for the motor. Okay, we also need to set the voltage select for the motor, the AVR, the automatic voltage select. We need to set that to 220. So that is A082. Let's go find that. A082, it's set to 230, let's set it to 220. That's the correct value for this motor is 220, okay. Uh, the next one is the current limit. Now the manual calls this level of electronic thermal, but they're basically just talking about how much current it's allowed to put through the motor. And that's B012, so let's go to the B settings. B012, and for this motor it's 10 amps. It's already set to 10 amps. Okay, that's good. 
And then we also want to set the carrier frequency. This thing will run anywhere from, I think, like 2 kilohertz to 15 kilohertz. And I don't want to hear the carrier frequency, so we're going to set it as high as practical. Uh, according to Alex at CNC Depot, he recommends 10 kilohertz. Beyond that, you don't really get any benefit, and it just puts additional heat stress on the motor. So that's B083. B083, and it's set to 10 kilohertz. Okay. There's a few extra things in here. Um, I want to set B165. This is what happens when contact with the external operator is lost. Since I'm gonna be using this external operator for the run and stop switch, if something happens and the VFD loses contact with this, I would like it to trip and just shut down. So I'm gonna set B165 to zero, which means it should trip if this gets disconnected. And this is just a safety thing. B165, it's set to two, which is ignore, and I'm gonna set it to zero, which is trip. So if this gets disconnected, the VFD should trip and go into a safety shutdown. Okay, so for input number three, where we hooked up the power, or we hooked up the thermal switch, we need to set that to e-stop so that it will actually kill the VFD if that gets triggered. And that's a C setting, C003. And it is already set to 12. That is um, e-stop. That'll actually cause it to shut down. And then we have to set the polarity of that. That's C013. And that needs to be set to normally closed. And that's already right there. 01 is normally closed. So that's already set to normally closed. So that means if we go in and disconnect that wire, the VFD will trip. Um, I'm not going to test that. Um, but if, if um, the motor does go over temp, it'll trip. Now, I did not have that connected when I let a little bit of the smoke out before, and uh, I learned my lesson. That will always be connected as the first thing before I set anything else up in the future. Let's check a couple of other things here. The motor capacity, it's a 2.2 kilowatt motor. That's H003. Should make sure that's right. I think it is by default. H003, yep, 2.2 kilowatts, that's correct. And H004 is the number of poles on the motor. This is a four pole motor, and it's set to four. Okay, that was the default, so that should be good. Let me just look through the rest of this. Okay, so I think that is enough to make this thing run. Now, I am going to monitor the current while we power this on, and that is D002. So I will set that, and it's showing 0, 0.0 amps. Set the speed to someplace in the middle of the range, and I'm just going to hit run to power it on, and the motor should turn. There it goes, and then this should control the speed. Slow it down and speed it up. You can see the motor's drawing about 1.3 amps. That's what we would expect. If that was 15 or 16, I would be shutting it down instantly. We'll go all the way up to 12,000 RPM. And that sounds pretty good. I'm hearing a little bit in the bearings, and uh, my understanding is that that's normal because they have not run in yet. And over time, as you get some hours on the spindle, those will quiet down. And it's also very cold here in the shop, and if this runs for a little bit and warms up, they should quiet down as well. Okay. Okay, that's working, but this is currently running in what's called VF mode, which is voltage frequency mode. It's not running in sensorless vector drive. This VFD has another mode called sensorless vector drive that allows it to run the motor with high torque at low speeds, and we want to enable that. And so there's a setting to turn on sensorless vector drive mode, and then we have to do a tuning operation on the motor 
to uh, get the parameters set properly so that it can control the motor in that sensorless vector drive mode. Okay, that is A044. So let's go to A044. Select that, it's currently set to zero, which is constant torque VF mode, and I wanna set it to three, which is sensorless vector drive. Okay, so that's set to three. Now that we have that set, we need to do the motor tuning operation. Now, there is a gotcha with this motor, and this is something that Alex let me know before I did this, is that you want to set the base frequency of the motor to 300 hertz for the auto tuning. For whatever reason, this motor responds better to the auto tuning when it's set to 300 hertz, so we'll go change that. That's A003, and then we'll set it back after we've tuned it. A003, and we'll set this to uh, 300. Now, I don't want to curse her down 100 or 1,000 times, so if you press 1 and 2 up and down at the same time, then it goes into a mode where you can edit one digit at a time. Okay, so that's set to 300. And now let's follow the tuning procedure. Okay, so we've already set H003, the motor size and motor poles. We've set the base frequency and the AVR voltage. Now we need to enable auto-tuning, and that is H001 and we need to set that to two, which will be tuning with motor rotation. And then all you do is just hit the run switch and the motor will tune, it'll do its tuning, and then it'll display the result, either a zero if it's completed with some underscores or uh, some little lines with an angle and we'll see what happens. So run. So I can hear it pulsing different amounts of power through the motor and presumably it's measuring the electrical characteristics. The motor's spinning up. I'm going to go turn the air on. I forgot to do that. Okay. And that shows auto tuning complete. This is what it says you'll get if it completed and succeeded. So clear the display with the stop key. Okay. And then activate the new motor constants by setting H002 to 2. Let's do it. Oops. H002. Set that to 2. Okay, let me just go back and make sure that H001 automatically reset. It did. Okay, and that should be it. We should be set in sensorless vector drive mode. Let's uh, go ahead and spin this thing up in that mode and see if it sounds any different. Just make sure, it, oh, wait. Got to say and change the frequency back. Change this back to 400 hertz. Okay, got the current display back here and sensorless vector drive is all set up. I think we're ready to run. I've got the speed set near the middle. Let's see what happens. Twelve thousand RPM. Set it down to something really slow. And it's turning. Should be able to run this thing really, really slow. I don't know how much torque it actually has at that speed, but it is turning. And 
and the current looks good. Well, I think that is all we're gonna to get to for today. It is really cold out here in the shop, and if you can't hear it in my voice, I'm actually shivering a little bit. This is what happens when you lose a bunch of weight, I guess. Uh, the next thing we need to do is configure the valve for the automatic tool changer, and I wanna wire that into the VFD and set up uh, what's called an interlock circuit to prevent the tool changer from being released while the VFD is spinning and we will work on that next time. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. If you have specific things you'd like me to cover in detail on this project, let me know and I'll see what I can do. Thank you for watching.